Hello and welcome to Sake Revolution, America's first sake podcast. I'm your host, John Puma from thesakenotes.com, the administrator of the internet's sake discord, and someone you might see on r slash sake on Reddit. And I'm your host, Timothy Sullivan. I'm a sake samurai, sake educator, as well as the founder of the Urban Sake website. And together, John and I will be tasting and chatting about all things sake and doing our best to make it fun and easy to understand. So, John, I just have to tell you, it was so much fun having your wife, Michelle, on our last episode, Married to Sake. <laughs> that was such a good time. It was a great Thanks time. Thanks for having my shell on. Oh, I, I, she had a great time too. And even though I was pretty quiet through most of the episode and like kind of letting her have the spotlight, I have to say it really reminded me and, and really made me think about how much her presence and her experiences changed the way I experienced Japan. It sounded like hearing about the experiences from her, she's kind of fearless. I, I, I could not walk into like unknown sake bars in the middle of a foreign country like that. Oh, absolutely. That's kind of amazing. Yeah, the, you know, I was totally like that where I couldn't go in. I would always be looking for English menus or a sign that said something about English menus. Yeah. Uh, and instead she comes along and, and we're walking around in like Shinjuku one day and like the kind of early evening. And we walk past this place and there's a bunch of sake labels in the window. And she is like, oh, we, we know the sake. Let's go here. And I'm like, my, 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 we can't, I, we don't, we don't know what's in here. We don't know what's going to happen when we go in. And she's like, ah, it'll be fine. What's the worst that happens? They kick us out? Fine. Whatever. And I'm like, okay. So we, we, could go, we went in. And since we knew that that sake was there, we sat down and we looked at the menu for a second and we ordered that sake. So now I imagine they probably think we know a little bit of Japanese because <laughs> we ordered something, quote unquote, off the menu. And we're sitting there drinking our sake and... At some point, the, the guys behind the counter start to confer and they're looking at us and they're trying to figure out what to do. And we're like, we're realizing this. We're like, uh-oh, they're onto us. And eventually they come over and ask us in like in a kind of broken English, like, you know, oh, what do you want to eat? And we're kind of like, no, it's fine. And they're like, <laughs> they're like, no, really. Like, and then the other one comes with a with a big like big uh, wooden box. He slides it open. And it's got eel, all the different components <laughs> that make up the eel. So it's like the outside of the eel, all the organs in the eel and skewers and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, he's like, do you want inside or outside? <laughs> oh, apparently this was an unagi specializing izakaya that we did not realize it. And we're both like, and, and. I should specify we don't eat, or at least at this point in our lives, did not eat unagi and was kind of yeah. mildly terrified. <laughs> and we're like, uh, um, uh, uh, check, uh, uh, um, kaikai onigashimasu. <laughs> Just... <laughs> so we finished yeah. our sake, we paid our bill, and we moved on. <laughs> wow. Well, it's very common in Japan to always order food. You know, it's not like a bar in the U.S. where you can go in and just get a beer and just sit there and chit chat. So they were really expecting you to order some food. Yeah. And, but that's that so a... sweet that they brought over the the <laughs> visuals to show you. That like... was a, a very intense visual aid, Tim, let me tell you. But I think having that experience, like after that, it's like, what's the worst that can happen? A guy can bring over... <laughs> A, a, yes. a wooden box of <laughs> eel parts and, <laughs> and I could say no thank you and leave and that's literally the worst that can happen and I did it and it's fine so yeah. after that it became so easy to go into these random places and have some of the best experiences of my traveling life it's really wonderful yeah when we were talking with uh, my shell we we did mention that the love of sake can break down barriers but I also want to say that learning little bits of Japanese and sake culinary culture really go a long way too. Mm -hmm. Like just that example of when you go to a restaurant, there's an expectation that you're always going to order food with your sake. Absolutely. Once you know that, it's so much easier the next time you go. Or if you learn a few words of the styles of sake you like in Japanese, then that just goes a long way to helping them bring you, like Michelle said, I like crazy sake. Or <laughs> if you say I like fruity style, something like that, really simple, it'll help them get you what you need that's all those little steps you take i think they really go a long way to helping you uh survive <laughs> trips to japan really really well yeah 
they're very accommodating. Survive is a strong word. It's always easy to survive, <laughs> but it, but thrive. We want to thrive when we go to Japan. Yes, yes. And I think that that really goes a long way towards it. And I think one of the things that she mentioned also on the show is that she really took a liking to Hiroshima sake. So that led her and I to visiting Hiroshima a couple of times. And it really is a place that spoke to us and we really uh, enjoyed being there and hanging out there and experiencing the local sake and the local scene. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Yeah, I've had the great pleasure of visiting Hiroshima myself. And for our listeners who haven't been there, it's on the main island of Japan, but it's in the far, far west. That's right. right. It's a lot of islands and a lot of water culture there, a lot of uh, Sea of Japan culture, but it's uh, in the far west of the main island of Japan. And as we mentioned with my shell, you know, okonomiyaki is a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. When we were studying up on going there, one of the things that popped up about okonomiyaki was this place called okonomimura and i don't know have you ever been no okay so didn't go there think of it as like a mall but for okonomiyaki so it's like yeah all right i know i know so (laughs) it's like three or four stories and inside of each floor are stalls and each one is a different okonomiyaki shop and they all specialize in different things they have different menus they might have slightly different styles but they're all oh my local Hiroshima okonomiyaki. And can you imagine the the New York version of that would be like if you had like a three story shopping mall and every place, every store was a pizza place. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <Can you imagine? laughs> it's, it's like oh Italy, but, but different. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I think that in Japan, that sort of thing isn't tremendously uncommon. Like in Yokohama, they have the ramen stadium, and yes. in Fukuoka, there is a there is also a ramen stadium. Wait a minute, ramen stadiums ramen are stadium popular. Picture. Okay, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah, but I think that speaks to how popular okonomiyaki is in Hiroshima. Oh, it it's is. kind of like the regional food, the great pride. Yeah. And if you visit, I visited a sake brewer in that city, and they took us to okonomiyaki as like to show us what the local cuisine was all yeah, about. Yeah, I think it's so a great it was, example of it. That's great. Um, yeah. May I ask what brewery did you visit? Kamoizumi. Oh, nice. I've never had yeah, the pleasure. So, oh, it's it's wonderful. And it's in Saijo, which we've talked about on a previous episode, which is like the in Hiroshima City, that's like the sake neighborhood with a, a gaggle of sake <laughs> breweries all in this all within walking distance. Yeah, quite of a each few. Other. Quite a few. That's that sounds like a, like a really good time. Now, when you were there, did you have any free time to yourself or did you spend most of your time visiting Saijo? Uh, I had a couple days off where I could go and do some sightseeing in Hiroshima. Uh, we went to the the Peace Park and I remember riding on a streetcar, too. That was really fun. Yeah. And it just left me with such you know warm feelings and everyone there was so nice. And I really I do remember this visiting Saijo, that sake neighborhood all the breweries had a similar architecture Mm -hmm. and it was a very unified feeling neighborhood. And there's a specific design style for all the sake breweries. They have this crosshatch marking on the bottom half of the buildings and then certain tiles on the roofs. And they were all similar in style. A lot of them had these brick smokestacks as well. Mm -hmm. So you could look around and see the smokestacks could tell you where all the, the breweries were located. And those are really for letting the steam out when they do the rice steaming. The steam can go out the the smokestack. And uh, they're not as functional nowadays, but in the past they were really needed. And they often have the logo on them as well. So you can literally walk around and see, oh, there's this brand, there's that brand. And uh, it was, I I remember having just such a wonderful time walking around and just taking in the atmosphere was great. That's great. For me, the, the three pillars of Hiroshima are like sake, Okonomiyaki and the Carp, which are their local baseball team. And they are everywhere. You cannot walk down the street without seeing some sort of Hiroshima Carp paraphernalia. It's I, I, I have never been to Chicago, but I imagine that around like Wrigley Field has probably got a similar feeling where everybody just loves the Cubs so much. It's like that kind of enthusiasm. It's very refreshing, actually. Being a New Yorker, we're very cynical about our baseball teams. <laughs> Yeah, the, but the, the 
the carp baseball team in Hiroshima is like they have food items and ramen and beer and all kinds of things that are carp branded. Sake. Don't they? Oh, sake yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> got to try that. Yeah. We, we got a little Hiroshima carp one cup. Oh, cool. Yeah. We're tying it all together. <laughs> My shell and one cups and Hiroshima. <laughs> well, I was thinking about what sake to bring for today. Mm -hmm. And I have a sake that I've actually never tried before. Really? This is yeah. Oh, that's, this is that's the this is the best kind, Tim. Yeah. So we're gonna get we're gonna get a real raw reaction from. Oh, me. this is gonna be good. This is nice. I'm glad you were able to get something from Hiroshima. It would have been really embarrassing if we did all this and then you were like, "Oh, and my sake is from Yamagata." Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you what I brought, and then you can let me know what you have over there. Sure. So I have a sake from Fuji Sake Brewery, mm -hmm. and. It is called Ryusei no Gomi no Karakuchi. Karakuchi. So this a, is a dry karakuchi. one. Karakuchi. So this is a dry sake. Okay. It's milled to 65%. The rice is Hatan Nishiki. And the sake meter value, that measurement of sweet or dry, is a plus eight on the scale. Ooh. So it does seem like it might be on the dry side for sure. Yeah, I believe that's similar to a one cup you had a few episodes back, too. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, you're on a dry kick right now, Tim. Yeah, and the acidity is 2.0, which is a little bit on the high side. So I'm excited to try this and see where we shake out. Hmm. So why don't you let me know what you have, John? So I have Joto Daiginjo, quote, the one with the clocks, unquote. Now, tick -tock, this is a little bit of a unique <laughs> situation. Uh, so in, in the United States, the importer, Joto, relabels this sake, but they're very open about where it's actually from. In this case, it is in Japan. This one is labeled as Maboroshi White Box Daiginjo. And Maboroshi is a very popular brand over in Hiroshima. And the name of the brewery is... Uh, Nakao Brewery, and they make quite a few really popular sakes, apart from the Maboroshi brand. And the reason that it's the one with the clocks is the label has a lot of has a lot of little clocks on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly why, but that, it, they do. They have a lot of clocks on it. <laughs> so the one you brought is a uh, Daiginjo. It is. I went uh, big today, Tim. This okay, one, the same Ibuai, is fifty percent, but it also is using that Hatan Nishiki rice that you talked about. Yeah, so I think that's something that we can say is pretty indigenous to Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that both of our sakes use that rice, even though they're probably going to taste really they're different. They're probably going to taste mildly mine, different. Mine, is a, <laughs> mine, I didn't mention, is a tokubetsu junmai or a special junmai. Mm -hmm. And you have a daiginjo. I do. And I'm sure mine will be delicious, but I'm a little bit jealous because <laughs> I know your sake tastes really good. I think what you mean to say is that the uh, is that mine is probably a little bit more in our wheelhouse, <laughs> whereas yours is your <laughs> you're expanding your horizons. Well, I am ready and willing to drink anything for education. There we go. Now, so, I'm uh, go ahead and open that up, and let's yeah, let's see what we have. Open this up. We have a little. So Tim's sake has a nice little uh, ribbon that goes across the top, kind of a symbolically keeping it closed. I think that's interesting. And a little plastic cork in the middle. Oh, All right. Ooh. So I see a little bit of, I don't know if you can see this, John, but there's a little bit of color there. That looks very amber uh, from my perspective. Yeah, it's, it's a straw color. Yeah. Um, so not crystal clear Ooh, what are you smelling so the aroma has just a hint of earthiness to it some rice a little bit of grain on the aroma and it almost smells a little bit chocolatey really chocolatey yeah yeah just like if you were to open up a milk chocolate bar and then smell the foil it's not like smelling a chocolate bar but it's that, that like chocolate adjacent smell mm, wafting chocolate <laughs> okay, <good>. wafting chocolate <laughs> from the other room <laughs> yeah okay i'm gonna go ahead and give this a taste mm. oh wow yeah? so the first thing i notice is that the acidity is much higher than i expected so acidity often translates on the palate as kind of this brightness mm -hmm. and um if you have no idea about like tasting acidity, 
if you think of like biting a lemon wedge, mm-hmm. that kind of salivating feeling you get on the side of your tongue. All right. That's a reaction to acidity. That's citric acid, which we don't have necessarily in sake. But that sensation is what you want to look for. You get a little bit of watering on the side of the tongue. And this has a 2.0 acidity, which is not off the charts, but it is high generally for sake. Mm. And I think they bring in a higher acidity to balance the other components of the sake. This has a 65% rice polishing rate, so it is relatively robust. It's not super fine, so we are getting that rice flavor as well. And I think this is a pretty open expression of that hata nishiki flavor. And it's a junmai, so there's no added alcohol to cover up or interfere with that rice flavor. So that grain and rice essence is really coming through. Mm, interesting. And so you're getting that essence of that hatan nishiki rice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the finish is quite dry. So it has an overall impression of being quite pointed and very crisp. Mm. And like a, my mind is getting this impression of something that is, you know, right to the point. It, it's not rounded or lingering or anything like that. It's more crisp and pointed, but with a, a layer of riciness, okay. that kind of a, an earthy riciness that I think comes from the Hatan Nishiki. Very delicious. And this is a food-friendly style of sake for sure. And I think the dryness and the, the higher acidity could pair well with things that have a richer sauce on them. Mm, okay. If you have a rich kind of creamy sauce, this higher acidity dry sake can really cut through that and cleanse your palate beautifully when you're having something a little bit more coating or a little bit richer. And I think this would pair really well with okonomiyaki. Oh, hey, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> local sake, local foods. Yes, excellent. Wonderful. So, John, why don't you open up yours? I'm really excited to see what you have to say about this uh, Maburoshi Daiginjo. I have been waiting to hear you say that. The nose is so interesting on this. It is a little bit fruity, but also something else, something like a, like a almost like a like an herb of some sort. It's very interesting though. Very unique. And a little hint of an apple too. Oh boy. Okay. So the mouthfeel on this is luxurious. It is lush. This is a Daikinjo style, so there is alcohol added. And one of the things we talked about when we were discussing this in our prior episodes is that one of the things they go for with that is playing with mouthfeel. And this is a masterclass in in using that for mouthfeel. This is wonderful. It coats the palate so perfectly. Yeah, daiginjos can often be very silky and like extra smooth, like surprisingly smooth. Very smooth. It's coating the palate, but it's also deceptively uh, light flavored also. It's very pleasant. Apparently they're using an apple yeast to make this Mm. sake also, which may explain that little hint of apple in the beginning there. Yeah, definitely nice, like a little bit of spice, a little bit of apple. Very, very, very satiny texture, like very luxurious. This is an extremely sippable sake. Right up your alley. Right? Yeah, this is very much the John Puma sits on the couch with a glass. And um, <laughs> this is, I would not have this with okonomiyaki. Uh, I think that two would very much get in the way of one another. And yeah, this is very, very lovely. And I think this is atypical for. What the, for the style of sake that Hiroshima is known for, I want to say, if you think that Hiroshima is known for Saijo, then this is very much outside of that style. Now, Saijo, much more known for being, would you say, like rice forward, a little more like a little more of that that caramely style to it. Mm. Whereas this is very lush, very dare I say, sexy tasting, um, and it's really nice. You dare? I you dare, dare. I did. I did. Well, the the interesting thing that connects both of our sakes is that hatan nishiki, that local indigenous 
sake rice from Hiroshima, Hata Nishiki. And the interesting thing for me is that my sake is like an overt expression of that. And yours uses the same rice, but you... It's completely subverted by, perhaps by the yeast, but definitely by that texture and the, and the apple taste. Oh, this is so good. <laughs> well, the, the rice milling, I think, plays a big role as well. Yeah. My rice grains were milled to 65% remaining, and yours go all the way down to 50% right. remaining. So that it, you could say, oh, it's only 15%. But I think with sake rice, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And you can really taste that. The outer layers of the rice grain contain the fats and the proteins. And as those get more and more polished away, you get more pure starch isolated. And then you can bring out other flavors using the yeast. You can bring out apple or you know different expressions of the sake. And as you mentioned earlier, the fact that yours is a true and my really lets that rice express itself more whereas mine is i guess further subverted by the fact that it's a daiginjo and it's not a pure rice style and they're just making a yeah. really interesting sake out of it yeah i couldn't agree more mm. the other thing i noticed is that i mentioned when i was tasting mine the acidity as well uh, mine has a 2.0 acidity and yours has a 1.3 acidity yeah. so much much lower acidity and generally, I often describe acidity as being between 1.0 and 2.0. So 2.0 or above is considered really higher acidity. Yeah. And 1.5 or below is a lower, more gentle acidity. And acidity often reads as dryness on the palate. Mm. Uh, so you can underscore a sense of dryness in a sake by boosting up, raising up the acidity a little bit. And lowering the acidity gives you that softer edge. And I think that's really what the brewers of your sake were going for. So, Tim, as we're sitting here uh, drinking sake from Hiroshima and we're talking about the city and, and our experiences, one of the things that really sticks out to me about Hiroshima is the local bar scene. A lot of the places there are really interesting and unique, and they have been some of my favorite Japanese sake bars in all of Japan, really. They're a little bit more lax about the food, which maybe may, may have something to do with it. The local culture is a little bit more like a bar rather than izakaya, even though there's always food. They're just really, really friendly and very accommodating. And the local places don't always... The local taste of the manager may not be oh, rah-rah Hiroshima all the time. It might just be this guy really likes a particular style of sake, mm. and he has that. Yeah. Uh, there's one place I love to go to called Flat, where the bar manager's favorite brand is Takachio from Niigata. So he gets every single limited edition Takachio, and if you're into their sake, it's a great place to visit. And he's enthusiastic. He'll talk about it to, at, at length. <laughs> now, there's another place called uh, Katoya, and then the owner there, Kato-san, his thing that he loves to do is to get sake that no one's ever seen before. Mm. He wants to get rare sakes and from brands that aren't anywhere else. And so you go there and you have a unique experience and try things that you've never heard of. It's a really wonderful and unique town from a sake lover standpoint. Yeah. And I, I think that's something that is really a good point because if you travel off the beaten track a little bit like most people who visit japan don't necessarily go to hiroshima if you're visiting from the states we've mentioned this a couple times before that if it's your first trip to japan and you're going to go to kyoto you're going to go to tokyo and you're going to hit the major places and places like an izakaya off the back alley in hiroshima somewhere is not the main drag for <laughs> international tourism so i think they have a little bit more leeway to be Free thinking and quirky. I think quirky is a good way to put it. I think quirky is a very good word. <laughs> yeah. And when a non-Japanese person walks in and says, I love quirky sake, they're like, they're in hog heaven too, because they want that kind of customer who's going to be open and go there with them and be curious about what, what they're there to teach you and show you. And those yeah. two examples that you mentioned, I think, are primo examples of the type of interesting and educational experience you can have at a Japanese sake bar. Ah, to make me wistful to go back to Hiroshima. 
really good town. I think it's uh, underrated. It should be on more people's radar, and not just to go for historical reasons. I don't think that I don't think the only thing to do in Hiroshima is go to the Peace Park. I mean, don't get me wrong; it's, a, it's an important thing, mm. but the the city just has so much to to offer, and it's a it's a beautiful place. And I gotta say, I'm kind of happy that for the first time in one of our deep dives, we've actually or I've actually been to a place <laughs> that we're talking about. This is great. <laughs> And uh, one other thing that I really like about there is uh, Miyajima Island. Mm. Uh, have you heard of it? I absolutely have. Yes, of course. It's yeah. pretty famous. Oh, I don't know. I have no. <laughs> I, I I I sort of live in a, a little bit of a bubble, and so if something permeates the fog that I live in, uh, I guess I guess it probably is famous at that point. Um, but yeah, we went there uh, the last time we were in town, and it was. And I'm I'm not a beachy person i'm not an outdoorsy person really but it was such a beautiful and wonderful experience uh got to you know kind of go on the on the beach when the uh, tide was low and i for people who are not familiar miyajima is famous for having a very large uh tim what do you what do you call They're those called tori uh, gates tori thank you very much i just, it completely slipped yeah. my mind I'm like i know what this word is but it's not coming out so very large tori gate that half the time is kind of coming out of the water and then during low tide it's, it is literally just like sitting there on the beach and you can go up and take photos with it and it's it's really beautiful the whole island is really gorgeous very nice and you can you can hang out some deer which is nice too yeah i think that view of that tori gate in hiroshima is one of the most famous views in japan maybe except for mount fuji like it, it right if you yeah. see it on a postcard you're going to recognize it you know what we'll do we'll put it in the show uh-huh. notes <laughs> Okay, Miyajima. here we go. The thing is, I'd seen pictures of this gate before and never, you know, oh, it's somewhere in Japan. And coincidentally, it was Michelle who was like, hey, we should go to Miyajima Island. And I was like, what? what's that? And she's like, it's a cool thing with the blah, blah, blah. And this, you know, there's all these traditional places. And I was like, ah, all right, you know, maybe. I still never get a bell. I've never heard of it. And then she's like, if, you know, the, this picture? And she showed me the picture that you're going to see in the show notes. And I was like, Oh, uh, that that's here. <laughs> yes. I had no idea. <laughs> so yeah, it's things that you can do in Hiroshima, go to Saijo, go to Miyajima, visit the local sake bars. You have a great time. And go to the Okonomiyaki three-story mall. <laughs> oh yes. Definitely go to Okonomimura. Okonomimura. Um, yeah. Yes. But you, chances are you can't go to a carp game because the fans have already bought the tickets. <laughs> That's actually okay with me. I'll just drink the carp sake, and that'll be my baseball experience. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I, I'm a little worried well, about going to the Okonomi shop. Okonomi, what is it? Okonomi <laughs> Mura. Okonomi Mura. Yes. You got it. I'm a little worried about going to Okonomi Mura shopping mall because I don't know if I would get beyond the first floor. You know, well, how I many mean, Okonomiyaki is- can I eat in one trip? Um, my answer is one, <laughs> by the way, because it's okonomiyaki is huge. You can't eat two okonomiyaki. It's very filling. And I know somebody, somebody right now is listening to this and being like, you "Absolutely, can. What's wrong with you?" <laughs> and you know, I say, "Sir or madam, congratulations," but I cannot. In this case, though, what I usually do when I go there is I look at the different menus, the different places. I I look at the different store, different floors, uh, and then and then I'll okay. This is what I'm going to have today. This is what I'm going to try today. So you kind of scope out the scene and try and oh find yeah, the definitely get a get a lay of the land, and see what which one speaks to you the most. Let's say let's say you don't like as much of the sauce on top. Yeah. Well, look for somebody who does a little bit less. Yeah. Let's say you let's say you really like cheese. Well, then go to a guy who definitely has cheese. Yeah. Yeah, things like that. I can see my shell bursting in there. Do you have crazy okonomiyaki? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that has not happened. Okay. Good. Uh, good. Because I imagine that, that crazy okonomiyaki probably involves a lot of seafood. That would scare me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to visit Hi- Hiroshima in person again. And we say this all the time, but as soon as... Do we, we have to do another episode when we go? <laughs> if we can take Sake Revolution on the road, we are definitely going to do an episode from Hiroshima. And I'd love to walk around Saijo and take it all in again. I think one yeah. one... Uh, positive we can take out of this whole stupid, awful COVID situation is that it's going to give me a great appreciation for traveling to Japan again. That's for sure. Don't you agree? Absolutely. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank all of our listeners so much for tuning in. 
We really hope you're enjoying our show. And if you'd like to support Sake Revolution, one way you can really help us out would be to take a couple of minutes and leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. It's really one of the best ways you can help us support the show. And be sure to subscribe wherever you download your podcasts and tell a friend so that they can subscribe as well. We don't want you to miss an episode. And as always, to learn more about any of the topics or the sakes we talked about in today's episode, be sure to visit our website, sakerevolution.com, for all the detailed show notes. If you have a sake question that you need answered, or you just want to tell us how much you love Hiroshima, please reach out to us at feedback at sakerevolution.com and let us know. So until next time, please remember, keep drinking sake and... Come